This is Sign Language with Bruce Williams and Doc Goldstein. Hi, and welcome to episode 161 of Sign Language. This is Bruce Williams from SignLanguagePodcast.com. You already know that. And I'm excited. I, I discussed this late last year, the idea of bringing on board a, a co-host for this podcast because uh, as anyone who's listened to Shutter's Inc. knows, that my photography podcast, the idea of having two heads works so much better than just one person talking to themselves. And uh, so I was uh, very excited when you know a guy who used to contribute to this podcast in written form only and who at the time had to guard his identity reached out to me, told me he'd retired and uh, and expressed an interest in coming on board so i am very happy to welcome as my co-host to sign language doc goldstein welcome aboard hey it's it's great it's great to be here and and actually be home at the same time it's funny <laughs> how that works <laughs> yeah for sure so i guess i i just want to backtrack briefly a little bit doc just to outline how how i got to this point so for those people who've listened to sign language right from the very start, you may recall that I used to do a podcast called Building the Pod, Understanding Adobe Audition. And that podcast was all about helping newbie podcasters create better sounding podcasts using Adobe Audition. And over the course of that podcast, I started to get listeners sending me emails, you know, Facebook messages and whatnot, uh, asking questions like, what sort of mic should I use? How do I treat the acoustics of my room? How do I set a compressor? How do I use EQ effectively? And I very quickly realized that these were the questions that weren't specific to audition. They were more general audio engineering principles. And it was off that realization that I decided, hey, we need a second podcast here, one that deals with more generic stuff that's not DAW specific. And so that's how sign language started. And over a course of time, the conversation kind of got out of my control. It started to delve off into areas that I really felt I didn't know anything about. And stupidly, I thought that was a good time to shut it down, where really that, you know, I should have played the role of moderator and allowed the conversation to go where it wanted to go. And the reason I mention that is because late last year when I was talking to Greg Anderson, he sent me an email and he, one of the things that he said really jumped out at me. He said, who is your audience? And it really rocked me back on my heels and I thought that is a question that I should have been asking myself a lot sooner and, and that has kind of got a little bit lost. It started out that the intended audience of this podcast was people who wanted to create podcasts. But over the course of time, it's kind of branched out into home recording enthusiasts and people who are just audiophiles. And so I wanted to kind of do a reset, you know, bring a doc on board. It was a good opportunity to, you know, start that conversation again and to more clearly identify the parts of the podcast and who they're identified, you know, or who they're aimed at. Uh, so that is my intention with this, you know, third iteration of sign language, if you like. As for Doc and I, wow. Well, Doc, Doc, you were listening to this podcast years ago. I was listening to the podcast because I'm kind of a crazy person for all things audio, <laughs> you know, and I love I loved to talk shop. So, you know, it's not unusual for me to hurt, hunt around uh, for podcasts. And I've come across quite a few that are talking about audio, and yours was one of them. Yep. And there's been a few others that I thought were really, really good. And um, so, hey, I love to talk shop. And I contacted you, and, and we had a couple of posts back and forth and what have you. Yeah. And then the next thing the next thing I know, you had reason to come to town. I That's don't remember right. what that was. It was part of my lynda.com obligations when I was recording training for Linda. Yeah. Yeah, I remember that now. So you came to town, and so we had a chance to meet in person, and I took you up to the studio where I worked, which was a major motion picture studio. Yeah. It still is, except I'm not there right now. That's and, right. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, it is so you know, much so less for your absence, mate. <laughs> oh, 
<laughs> yeah, I think so. <laughs> but in, in any event, we got to meet, uh, you know, and um, you saw that I take the train to work, which is really interesting because there's a train station right across from the studio. So yeah. it was very handy for me because I live, for those of you who are not from Australia or maybe from some other uh, even farther flung place, <laughs> if there is a farther flung place, you know, um, I live about yeah, an hour and a half away from the studio where I worked. So the train for me, uh, I became a metro uh, person. You know, yeah. started taking the train. But in any event, you took the train with me one day, and we got a chance to know each other a little better. And then your podcast dropped from view because yep. you got to a point where it was just, you know, a drag or didn't work out. So you got away from it. It's, and then by pure chance, we hooked up again, uh, and here we are. Yeah. You know, sounds easy, but, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. you know, here we are. I still love to talk shop and, you know, I'm teaching recording engineering, you know, now. Nice. Because I like to keep myself off the streets, you know. <laughs> daytime yeah. TV gets really old. So. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so I'm doing that, which is great because it gives me a chance to turn the lights on on a few heads and keeps me on my toes as well. Uh, so the kids are really smart. And then I bumped into you and here we are. Nice. Okay. Uh, so, well, should we talk? Talk through your home studio setup. What what sort of gear have you got, and, and and what do you use your home studio for? Well, okay, so it's kind of a loaded question because you know I'm a Pro Tools person, and yeah. I know that you're not. That's okay. That's okay. <laughs> that ought to be worth a couple of podcasts right there. Oh, for uh, sure. <laughs> uh, but for the sake of today, my voice is coming through a Shure microphone, an SM57, which is kind of a common combination microphone and hammer. Oh, that's the that's the army workhorse of microphones. Oh yeah, you can't kill it even if you try. <laughs> that's right. It's just like an SM58 without the uh, windscreen. Yeah, that's plugged into an API preamp. Ooh, uh, nice. Which, uh, you know, I'm a big API fan. Same. We had one in my when I was at Waller Hiders, We had uh, an API in one of the rooms, Studio Three there, and I fell in love at that time. That was the late '70s. So I'm older than 13. So. Uh, <laughs> Just a little. <laughs> and out of the mic preamp, I'm going into my uh, Avid HDIO because I'm running Avid HD and I'm using the HDIO, which for those of you who are familiar with Avid hardware, it looks just like a 192 except it's dark gray. And that, of course, is hooked up to the Mac and uh, so on and so forth. And then I'm not using them right now, but my main monitors of choice are uh, Genelec 8040s and a matching Genelec sub. Which is not an ad for Genelec. It's just what I'm using. Oh, mate, I'm a, I'm a big big fan of Genelec monitoring myself. Yes, yeah, so I noticed. You know, uh, so uh, that's what I have at home. I got a bunch of other junk all hooked up to it because I have a lot of analog I/O, and I have a bunch of outboard equipment hooked up, and I have some good microphones and stuff like that. So you know, I, and I use the studio for sometimes I use it for things that I'm going to do at school, and it, so I can go in there and having done some of the things so i don't look stupid because yeah. i hate when that happens <laughs> uh but i also i also record stuff and uh, sometimes i record bands and playback stuff or do i do a lot of mixes here right so i i just keep busy that's all yeah nice so uh, a bit of a home recording enthusiast yourself i am a home recording enthusiast who has a history of not being a <laughs> uh, not recording at home yeah, i actually yeah. learned and you know i was very fortunate because when I was learning recording, there still were studios in every corner. I mean, in Hollywood, you know, you could trip and fall and land at the doorstep of a studio. And yeah. it's certainly not like that now, but I had the opportunity of learning from a lot of really good people. And then when I was in the film studio part of it, my big thing there was that I had just the greatest team. I only looked good because I had great people who wanted to work with me. <laughs> and uh, that sounds like, I know that sounds like, corny sort of thing but it's hey, true that was henry that's, ford's that's approach was always hire smarter people than yourself yes unfortunately it was easy to find people who fit that description <laughs> <laughs> okay you yeah. know so here i am and i still love to talk shop i love to talk microphones and preamps and yep. reverb units and what to do in case of this and that and and what the beeps are for when you're doing uh adr and uh foley sure. so you name it I want to talk about it. And sometimes, I, I, actually often, we might run into things that I'm not familiar with, and that's cool too. Yeah, yeah, I'm not for sure. Because I'm admit that. Um, and I one, might learn something. One thing I do just want to throw in, uh, as long-term listeners will know, 
Doc used to contribute to this podcast in written form and he had to guard his identity because of where he worked. We are not going to mention that studio by name and we would appreciate it if you guys could do the same as listeners. Uh, By all means, you know, please send us questions, send us all that sort of stuff, but let's not make it public as to where he worked. Anyone can Google it, but we're not going to make a thing of it because that company has a thing about protecting its brand. And I just as wanted, they should. As they should, absolutely. And I, I just wanted right. to get that out there nice and early so we don't go tripping over ourselves. Yeah, and I'm not speaking as a, in, as a representative of no, that studio. It's no, a, of course. You know, it's, a, it's a great place with great people. Oh, you know, absolutely. But, it's not, but, it, but, it's, but I'm not part of it anymore. So Yeah. All right. Well, that's, that's great. I'm, I'm so excited for where this podcast will go now with you know a, a co-host on board and, and particularly someone of your caliber, Doc. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. So they say. Caliber. <laughs> hmm. no, don't be blowing smoke, okay? <laughs> <laughs> All right. I tell my students not to do that because it won't help their grade. Right. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, so during the week, I set up a new Facebook page uh, for Sign Language Podcast, uh, which I know a, a, a lot of people have already gone and liked the page and all future uh, cross posts of the podcast as it releases will go to that page and not to my personal Facebook profile. Uh, so if you haven't yet liked the Sign Language Podcast page on Facebook, Uh, make it a point to do so as you're listening to this podcast. I will put a link in the show notes so that uh, it's easy for you to find it. Um, But I heard from Dave King uh, just a couple of days ago, and Dave's been a listener to this podcast for quite a while. And uh, he sent me this message, and I thought it was a a great question, and I thought Doc and I could both uh, riff on this question and and hopefully come up with some, some answers for him. This is what he said. Hey Bruce, here's a topic I don't think you've discussed before. It involves a dilemma I'm facing right now. I was given a new all-in-one computer, like an iMac, that I'm considering using in my home studio. Currently, I'm using a conventional PC with a tower. I have the tower located in an adjacent room from the room I record in to avoid picking up noise from the computer. I ran the necessary wires through the wall from one room to the other, and it works well. My recording space is essentially silent. This new computer presents the issue of introducing noise into my recordings since it needs to be located in the same room I'd be recording in. As you know, recording multiple tracks of vocals, acoustic guitars, etc., with the computer running in the background can result in an increased noise floor multiplied by the number of tracks. I'm curious... In the studios you work in, and your own, where's the CPU for the computer located? Is it ever in the same room that tracking is done in? If so, how is the computer noise attenuated? In my scenario, the computer would likely be located on a desk within five to six feet of the microphone. Your thoughts? Thanks. Great question, Dave. Yeah, it's a great question. And and a challenging one. <laughs> to answer your last part first uh, about my setup, I have a, a large wooden desk, which I'm sitting at right now. It's about mm, five or six feet wide and about three feet deep. It's a big desk. And my computer is actually sitting underneath this desk as I'm recording. Now, one thing that I wanted to get to was the sources of noise within a PC, essentially threefold. Your first one would be your power supply, which is a you know, big blocky thing, roughly six inches cubed. Uh, in older PC cases, they tend to be located at the top of the case. In some of the newer uh, case designs I've seen, they're locating the power supply at the, at the bottom, closer to the ground, uh, to lower the center of gravity. Those things generally have at least two fans on them, one that's facing into the box, sucking air from the box into the power supply, and then another fan which is blowing air out of the power supply out into the, you know, into the room. Uh, So that's one source of noise. Then you've got your magnetic drives, you know, your, your normal hard drives with spinning platters. Now, the rotation of those platters and the movement of the arms across the platters to retrieve and write data that creates noise. Now, obviously, as we move towards SSDs, then 
magnetic drives will soon go the way of the dodo. But at the moment, and, and this is certainly an issue for those of us who record audio and edit video and that sort of stuff, is capacity. SSDs of any you know decent size, like over a terabyte, are still hideously expensive when compared with a magnetic drive. Uh, but that will change over time. And your third tends to be graphics cards. You know, if you've got a, a fairly decent graphics card, it's going to have fans of its own. And those are the three major sources of noise within a PC, and, and presumably within a Mac as well. I've never looked inside a Mac, I don't know. So what can you do to deal with those noises? Well, like I said, mine's sitting underneath the desk. I don't get too cut up about the noise of the PC because it's a constant sound. It's not something that fluctuates over time. It's very constant. And the beauty of any constant noise source, and particularly something that's reasonably quiet, is that you can always take a noise profile from it and run some noise reduction. Now, obviously, Dave, you're recording music, and I can understand you may not want to be running noise reduction on the tracks that you've recorded i can definitely un- although i've had some good luck doing that and i'll talk about it when you're when yes it's my same turn. same so you know so the the approach that i generally take is i record my voice for my podcasts warts and all if there's a little bit of pc hum in the background i don't get too cut up about it i'll either run noise reduction or i'll just run a soft noise gate and i'll generally use something like isotopes nectar plugin which is designed for vocal processing uh, it has a quite customizable noise gate built into it yeah doc what, what have you got to add to this well i'm embarrassed to say that i actually do have my computer in the same room as everything else here yeah right <laughs> you know and if i was as picky and as perfectionistic as i am accused of being i probably wouldn't have that that way <laughs> i'd probably have it in a closet somewhere with the kvm okay you know box yep. That's probably a good way to to run a system if you really want to be ultra quiet. But, you know, usually when I'm recording here, I'm usually using a cardioid mic pattern and I just aim the mic away from the computer and it tends to really sort of notch it out right there. Sure. Uh, I don't have I don't have so much that it's a huge problem. But if I do remember that I'm recording in Pro Tools and one of my plugins that I use is an isotope plugin called RX. Yep. Now, I, I've got an older version. I think it's RX3, but I think they're up to five now. That's right. But it's a it's a great program because it can sample the noise and calculate it out that way, but it also has really high Q dip filters in it for hum that work really well. And I'll be happy to talk about what Q is, you know, if it gets to that point. Oh, but for sure. it's just really um really works for me. It work and so, you know, I'm kind of embarrassed to say I do have the computer in here. But I would ask your listener uh, if he's thought about a KVM to solve his problem. Well, that's a, that's an interesting question. Uh, Dave, you can come back to us on whether or not this new all-in-one that you've bought, uh, does it have the option to run a second monitor via a, another input? And if so, could you potentially move the all-in-one into the other room where you previously had your PC tower? And could you then just run you know, a monitor cable with an external, yeah, obviously the keyboard and mouse are external. They're not part of the all-in-one. So they can still be run through from another room as per your old setup. The question is really is just, does the all-in-one have some sort of video output connection, whether it's HDMI or DVI or uh, display port or something like that, that you could take the graphic output and run it to another monitor. I guess, yeah, that's a, an interesting way to, to approach it. Well, I, in the past, I've used KVMs a lot to mow a lot of Macs. You know, uh, right. like you might have a machine room just full of Macs and a KVM them all out to other rooms where they need to be, and that really works. So that's the question. Can you do that with his iMac? So a KVM as a switch box, it would simply need an input of a video signal just as an external monitor would. Is that correct? Well, a KVM will take the mouse 
uh, and the keyboard and the video signal and remote it all. Right. So you could have like, you know, you could be some distance away and they don't have to be expensive if you don't get a massive system. I mean, yes, you can spend entirely too much in a professional environment, but just for the home, you shouldn't have to spend a lot of money to get that to work. And that would probably solve his problem. Yeah. As long as his computer does have a video output, like you said, like a DVI or display port or whatever. Yeah. I'd be interested to know, Dave, is is this new all-in-one system really that loud? I, I mean, I, I don't know what type of music Dave King records. It, it, you know, it may be that he's doing, you know, soft acoustic stuff and therefore he needs a bit of gain on the microphones and even a small amount of PC noise creates an issue for him. I'd certainly look at the possibility of running noise gates if you can't get the all-in-one out of the room. Or as as Doc suggested earlier, you know, where possible, use the polar patterns of your microphone to your advantage. Uh, if you've got anything that's a figure eight, obviously you'd set that up at right angles so that the the null on the sides of the figure eight was pointing to where the computer was located. That would certainly reject any noise from the PC. Or if it's a cardioid pattern, you'd point the the back end of the microphone towards the PC because that's where you'll get the most rejection. Don't you don't you use a figure of eight, Mike? Didn't you? Well, the mic I'm on now. Did you buy a ribbon? Yeah, yeah that's yeah, what that's that what I'm recording on now. That's one of Les Dooley's mics. That's right. An AEA R84. Yeah. Well, those those are really good mics, and it's, it's actually amazing how well the null on the sides of a ribbon mic are. Oh, it yeah. Really, it really rejects really well. It does. It's great. So, you know, I don't know. You could potentially look at uh, other ideas of, you know, setting up, foam barriers that you could maybe stand around the pc while you're recording dave i realize that's going to block your view of the screen but that's something else you could potentially look at but i'd i'd certainly investigate the the possibility of moving it out into the other room and if there is some sort of video output that would allow you to then view the output of that on another monitor, then you could still run a similar setup to what you've got. Well, I, I suspect that because we've both admitted to having our computers in the room with us, we have now uh, turned off and knocked out all of the ultra hi-fi guys who are listening, <laughs> listening to the show. At, as, at this point, you know, wait a minute, I just spent $10,000 on the best speaker cable I can, and now these guys have the computer in the room? I can just imagine. <laughs> Well, like I said, for a podcast, it's it's not as critical as if you were trying to do, you know, really high fidelity acoustic recordings, you know, where you're hoping that your end product will be consumed by like minded audiophiles who will appreciate every nuance of the recording and you know i can i can appreciate that that requires you know maybe just stepping it up a notch in terms of your attitude towards noise for a podcast i'm you know like i said I've, i've explained my reasoning for the way i approach it the way i do and and by the time it's compressed down to an mp3 yeah you know i can live with it you're using a very high quality mic you know for your podcast but yeah um, I know a lot of other podcasters are using uh, USB microphones, yep. and those are okay. They're fine, but they're not $5,000 microphones either. So no. it's not like – I agree that for a podcast, it's not so critical. But on the other hand, if you really are interested in just getting the absolute best quality you can and you're recording acoustic instruments or something like that, then I think it's incumbent upon you to not only remote your computer, but also be looking at the acoustics and the environment and noise from outside and that sort of thing. Definitely. At that point, you're talking about a real studio. That's right. For example, right now, my studio is set up in a spare room, fairly large sized room, but spare. And it's really raining here right now. Really? I don't know if you can hear it over my mic, but it's... We're in the middle of this big storm in Southern California, wow. and I'm, that's where I am. For those of you who haven't figured it out, I'm in <laughs> you know Orange County, California here. Yeah, I'm in. I'm actually in Fullerton, where Fender started. Is that right? Yeah. I mean, I knew you were in Fullerton, but I didn't know that that was where Fender started out. Wow. Yeah, Fender started out in Fullerton. I was drive by. There's a picture of a Leo Fender recording or doing some PA work outside of the police station from like the 40s and I still drive by that same police station and every time I do I always remember that photograph of Leo out there with his PA equipment so that's awesome 
Yeah, and there's a, there's another good guitar manufacturer that's also based in Fullerton. So that's where I am. So it really couldn't be farther from Sydney, could it? <laughs> no, not really. <laughs> My uh, my wife and I were only discussing this morning that uh, in June and July of this year we're heading to Europe for four weeks, and our our first flight is Sydney to Doha, and uh, that's fourteen and a half hours. And uh, and Kath was saying, "Oh my God, that flight is just going to kill us." And I said, "Well, it's really not much more than here to LA." And I think I think it's about twenty minutes longer than Sydney to LA, and Sydney to LA is a long flight. So. <laughs> Doha. Okay, so pardon my geography. Oh, sorry. That's that, that that is the capital of Qatar. Uh, oh, okay. Q A T A R, which is um, uh, just to the west of the United Arab Emirates, sort of on the west coast of the. Oh, oh, oh. Now I'm now I'm stretching it. I can't remember the name of the body of water. Is it the Persian Gulf? I think it might be the Persian Gulf. And from there and from there where do you fly? Uh, so we we will then fly Doha to Geneva and then we we land in Geneva on a Monday night. We're picking up a brand new car and we're then driving down to Marseille, uh, then all the way along the coast uh, staying at Carcassonne in France, then we're going down into Spain. Uh, over to Portugal, up the west coast of Portugal, back into the north end of Spain to San Sebastian, up through Bordeaux, into Paris, drop off the car, a few days in Paris, uh, then over to London, meet up with Max, my son, because th- this whole trip eventuated because Max has a four-week school excursion to France. Poor kid, so deprived. Um, <laughs> you need to find a way to make this a tax write-off, this whole trip. <laughs> Yeah, tell me about it. <laughs> so uh, at the end of Max's four weeks, they the school group goes over to London for two days. And so we are aiming to get into London the same time as him. He'll then meet up with us, leave the school group, and then the three of us will fly home uh, London, Doha, Doha, Phuket in Thailand. And we're going to spend three days in Phuket getting over the jet lag because that'll pretty much get us back into the same time zone as Sydney. It'll be a couple of hours out. So three days there and then home and back to work. Well, I'm officially jealous. Let me tell you, that sounds like a great trip. <laughs> it does. We and are the so food looking... in Thailand, the oh, food yeah. there in Thailand should be unbelievable. Oh, look, the food everywhere. I'm, I'm hanging out for the Spanish food and the Portuguese food. That's going to be awesome too. Oh, yeah. But but yes, you're right. We love Thai food as well. So so yeah. take along a handheld recorder and uh, make, it a, make it a business trip. Yeah. I will be. I have a little Tascam DR05. Uh, and a couple of years ago, I went to Borneo for the second time, and I took that recorder with me and uh, recorded lots of sounds of the jungle and uh, the noise of the bats in the caves and things like that. It was absolutely spectacular stuff. I loved it. So, yes, I will definitely be taking my handheld recorder with me, Doc. Yeah, fear not. <laughs> you should build – maybe you should build a sound effects library out of some of these recordings. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Or maybe you could uh, have some of these tracks added to an existing sound effects library. Maybe make a couple of bucks that way. Hey, that's a good idea. Sure. Yeah. And, you know, people who have sound effects libraries are always trying to add more sounds to them because uh, it's cheaper and faster to have a library that has what you need as opposed to sending somebody out with a recorder and recording something. Exactly. So. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, nice one. Sorry, a little diversion there. Didn't mean to. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, that's going to be a, a nice trip. But, yeah, that flight from Sydney to Doha, that's going to be, yeah, that's a long one. It's apparently like one of the longest single-haul legs on the planet, apparently. Uh, now, anyway, we, we got a little bit sidetracked there. Now, when Doc and I started recording this podcast half an hour ago, that we were hoping that Doc would be able to record his side of the conversation in his studio and we would have studio quality voice we encountered a technical glitch so what you've heard up until now was doc coming over skype but now doc's got his system uh happening uh, and he's recording his voice locally uh, yes and, and so now we have doc in studio quality this is awesome so i'm going to blame it on the weather because it's really bad outside it's really yeah, right that's unheard of for los angeles <laughs> yes, it, it's been happening lately. We've had quite a bit of rain. I think that we've really cured a lot of the California drought issue. Oh, that's good. 
you know, so that's pretty good. We had a, you may have heard on the news, but there was a dam up north that had a spillway. Yes, I have uh, seen bad. stories about that over the last few days. What's happened there? Well, um, they got the water level down, and thank God it's worked out without any injuries that I'm aware of, and it never did flood a city or anything. So I think they're in good shape now, but I can't even imagine you know, what it must have been like for the people who had to work up there. But things are better now. So, oh, that's um, good. It's, I, think it's, I think it's okay, but I can't blame my Pro Tools issue on that, though. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, these things happen. You know what computers are like. They love to uh, just throw you a curly one every now and again. I had an instance this morning. I, I climbed out of bed. I walked into my studio here. I hit the power button on the PC thinking that it would boot up into Linux because I actually run a dual boot system here. I've got Linux and Windows 7. Okay. And I have the bootloader set to default to, to boot into Linux because basically I use Linux for everything these days except for audio and video work. Ah. That stuff I do in Windows 7. And so I w wandered off down to the kitchen and made my breakfast and I came back expecting it to be logged into Linux and there it was sitting on the BIOS splash screen saying that there was a disk error and press F1 to enter the BIOS to fix it. And I'm like, oh, no, I don't oh. need this right now. So I've gone into the BIOS pressed F8 for the boot menu, selected the Ubuntu petition and hit enter, and boop, off it went, and it booted just perfectly. And it's like, what the heck? Well, you know, it wouldn't have been unusual if it, if it all of a sudden still didn't boot right and you'd be <laughs> fighting the thing for hours. I know. Oh, yeah, I know. I know, but it's just so bizarre because I, I then shut down and did a reboot, and it booted perfectly. And it's like, what the? <laughs> Computers, wow. man. Anyway. Wow. Are you using, uh, speaking of that, are you using that Adobe software as your workstation? No. As longtime listeners to this podcast are aware, I used to be a diehard Adobe Audition fan. And because of the, the first podcast that I was doing, Building the Pod, uh, Understanding Adobe Audition, I was approached by Adobe and asked, would I like to become a beta tester? Which I did. For many years and in between version three and what we assumed was going to be called audition version four but actually ended up being called adobe audition creative suite five during that beta testing phase adobe announced that they were going to rewrite the entire app from the ground up new ui and it was going to be cross-platform and the beta testers, all of us, were like, wow, this is amazing. You know, it's going to be available. Yeah, it sounds on, great. Going to be on Mac as well as PC because the Mac world had been screaming out for years, when will Audition come to the Mac? And Adobe's stance had always been when hell freezes over. Because <laughs> they said it's, it's too hard to maintain two code bases with the limited team we've got. So when they announced this to the beta testers that this was going to happen, we were like, wow, this is awesome. But then they turned around and said, Given the time frame we've got to get this done and out to market, there are some features that are in the existing version that aren't going to make it into the next version. And we were like, what? And they said, yeah, 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 we know. The marketing team's got its you know work cut out for it. And uh, so there were all these features that got left out. And... That kind of threw me in a hole because one of the features that they left out was the ability to interface with an external control surface like a Mackie Control Universal, which I have in my studio. And I rely on that. You know, I use that every time I'm working with audio. And so for me, that was a real deal breaker. And so it was at that point that I started looking around for something else to use. And I had for years heard about Reaper, had never looked at it downloaded it and within an hour I'd forked out the money for a license I just went wow this is phenomenal and I'm still using Reaper today so seven well, you know I haven't I haven't used it but um there are I have a lot of friends that I have tremendous respect for who do use it and they like it a lot it uh, is so. phenomenally flexible there is so much you can do with it it's crazy will it chase time code and work with picture and do pull downs and things yep, like that all of that I, I actually wow. I actually mixed a film soundtrack in 5.1 here in my home studio for a, a, a mate of mine who lives in Seattle who did this little independent seven-minute short 
uh, and he wanted it mixed in 5.1 and I did the whole mix in Reaper uh, using a, a video render track in MP4 that he'd sent me and he sent me all of the stuff that he'd done in Pro Tools format and I have a, a mate here in Sydney who wrote a program called AA Translator and what that does is allow you to open a multi-track session format from any one of about 12 different DAWs and output it in the format of any one of the other 11. And so I was able to take the Pro Tools sessions and translate them into Reaper files and then open the multi-track sessions in Reaper uh, and take all the work that had been done in Pro Tools and then continue working on it in Reaper, build a 5.1 mix, and yeah, it was amazing. Well, that's much better than just having to import files and hope they were in sync. Oh, absolutely. That's great. Yeah. So this friend of yours must be a pretty good software guy. Oh, he is. He's a software developer by trade, and this AA translator was something he did in his spare time. And uh, yeah, and it started out, the, the, the way that came about, and apologies to the audience who have already heard this story, but the way this came about was that in his little project studio that he was running in the suburbs of Sydney, he was running Adobe Audition, but he was having all these young kids who were, you know, forming bands with their high school mates who all had, you know, like Pro Tools LE at home who were doing some pre-production work in Pro Tools and bringing it to his studio and going, oh, we've done all this pre-production work and we want to, you know, add our guitars and drums or whatever to what we've already done. And he couldn't read it because he wasn't running Pro Tools. And so that's why he started out simply wanting to convert Pro Tools into Adobe Audition-friendly session files. And once he'd back-engineered the code, he realised... Well, once you've broken one, it's pretty easy to, to break all the rest, you know. And so uh, it just became this, you know, two-way translation engine that'll allow you to go from any format to any format. I can sense people getting nervous in Northern California, <laughs> even as you speak. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think he was hoping that, you know, one of the, you know, DAW manufacturers might at least buy his intellectual property from him. Yes. And, and you know what? That could still happen at some point, and I hope it does, because he absolutely deserves the credit. He did a great job. So um, for, for anyone who hasn't checked it out, his name's Mick. Uh, you can find him on the Reaper forum as username Runaway, and you can find his uh, AA translator software on the web at sweetspotstudios.com.au. But yeah, anyway. Is he physically near you in Australia? Well, he's in Sydney, so I'm, I'm located around an hour, hour and a quarter north of Sydney. Uh, it's probably a two-hour drive to where he lives from my place. Oh, okay. Yeah. Why do you ask? Oh, I was just curious. Yeah, right. Just curious. It's a lot closer than I am. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> <laughs> when you, so when you came over here a few years back, when you flew over here, yeah. how long were you in the air to get here? Uh, around about 14 hours and five minutes, I think it was. Wow. It's just a yeah. shade over 14 hours. It's a, it's a long trip. I hope you were at least business class. No. Cattle class. You were in steerage. Okay. Yep. <laughs> yep. <laughs> wow. <laughs> but the, the thing I've worked out, and this certainly works when you fly from east to west, is make yourself, you know, have a really long day and catch a red eye flight. Because that particular trip that you're referring to, I got to L uh, LAX, I had an 11 o'clock flight out uh, in the evening. And I'd been up since about 4.30 or 5 o'clock that morning. And I got on the plane and I absolutely died. And I remember waking up at one point and thinking, oh, I'm getting a bit stiff. I need to get up and have a, a bit of a stretch and a walk around. And I've looked at my watch and... I figured I must have been half asleep because I've looked at the time and gone, no, no, that doesn't make sense. And then I've, you know, switched on the screen on the, you know, back of the headrest in front of me to find the, the map of where the plane was on the planet and found that we were over Fiji and I had slept for 10 hours and it was only four hours to home. And I was like, woohoo, I can deal with that. <laughs> so, so, yeah, so definitely... Uh, 
get those those east to west flights you definitely want to be absolutely trashed and you can just sleep it off sleeping on an airplane i'll have to think about that one. Oh, really you don't sleep on planes well i haven't you know, but to be fair, I haven't taken a flight that's been that long. You know, yeah. the farthest I've had to fly is New York, and right. that's not really worth that's not really worth sleeping. That's like five out five was, six hours. Yeah, yeah, is all. So cool. Yeah. Hey, listen, there's a couple of other things that I have accumulated over the last month or so that I wanted to uh, put into the next episode of Sign Language before I realized I had such a great co-host. Uh, so I'm just going to quickly run through those, and these links will be in the show notes. The first one was an infographic on data compression versus audio compression. Did you have a look at this link, Doc? I did. I had a look, I had a look at the link. I thought right. this was so clever in the way that they laid it out and it for people who are new to it and you know might not necessarily understand the correlation you know and and how audio compression is different to data compression i thought this was a really simple concise way of explaining you know the difference between the two yeah i think the only thing similar is the word compression yeah, exactly. But but that's what can, can cause confusion for people who are not audio engineers, you know, who are new to this, and you know, particularly people who are new to starting a podcast. And you know, they hear the, the term compression thrown around, uh, but in one context it might be audio compression, in another context it could be referring to data compression. You know, creating a, an MP3 out of a WAV, and they may not necessarily understand that there is a difference in these two types of compression. And I thought this was a great graphic for explaining how those things differ i think so and also in both types of compression overdoing it on purpose is a good way to get a, a feel for what it sounds like so for example with my students when i'm talking about audio compression i will demonstrate it set up so that there's far too much going on so they can hear how yep. it squashes the sound and how it can be irritating after a while <laughs> and then in, in terms of uh, data compression you know, I'll have them make an MP3 file at the slowest possible rate, you know, with the yeah, nice. amount of bits and all that. And they get a chance to hear how bad that can sound. Uh, swirling monkeys is, is <laughs> if somebody used that phrase that you hear this swirling monkeys in the background of a really bad MP3 file. And, and, I, and I don't know who, who takes credit for that, but it sure was a great way to explain it because you hear all this weird noise yeah. going on in a bad file. And uh, I don't let my students turn in anything that's data compressed either. You know. Oh, okay, while. nice. It's got to all be in a Pro Tool session. Right. So. so anyway, that link will be in the show notes for anyone that wants to check that out. Uh, the next one was the, the depths of the ocean are quite noisy. And this was a, a link all about the just the sounds that were heard at the, uh, I think it was like at the bottom of the Mariana Trench, which is, you know, 10.9 kilometers under the surface and uh, and it was phenomenal how much noise was evident even at that depth and there's a, a couple of different files that have been hosted on soundcloud that you can have a listen to well i was listening to it and i was listening to it and i wondered if they did a recording that lasted you know a few years in length if they could then filter out everything except the actual plates of the earth moving <laughs> wow wouldn't that be epic you would really need some serious high pass, uh, low pass filter uh, on that. But can yeah. you imagine that? And wow. as timely as that is, I, I, I remember hearing on the news just today that they had discovered a, a new plate down where yes. you are. That they, yes. It's sort of just north of the Philippines. Uh, yeah. they call, they're calling it Zealandia. Yeah. I did see that yesterday. That is amazing. It is. It, it strikes me as odd that that has not been identified up until this point. I right. Mean, we've had tectonic plate theory for, I don't know, 80 odd years now. Uh, I would have thought that they would have identified where all the individual plates were on the planet by now, but apparently not. Well, we're going to have to go record that plate. That's all there is to it. <laughs> Imagine if you could, as, as you said, you know, record it for, for like a, a year or two, and then you could filter out everything that wasn't, tectonic plate movement and then you could increase the speed down to a few minutes so that you could actually hear it happening yeah that's what i was thinking uh, yeah that would be awesome <laughs> sounds like a star trek sounds like a star trek episode but you know but you know, you know it might be, it you know might what be james cameron's recording. probably already doing it you know <laughs> probably 
<laughs> he's probably on his way down there with one of those you know, deep water vessels. That's you know. right. <laughs> Maybe he discovered the new plate. Who knows? Who, yeah, who knows? That wouldn't surprise me at all. I saw a thing in Tape Op 115. I don't know if anyone reads Tape Op, and I, I, I have to confess, I don't read every edition of it. I really should. But they were referring to- I like to, it. Yeah. I like that magazine. I, I, I like it. I really do need to make an effort to read it more. Uh, but this was regarding the transfer from audio master tape to vinyl. And the quote is, the tape machines that were used to play the master tapes were fitted with an extra pre-listen head over to the left of the regular head stack. This head would sample the audio slightly before the regular playback head. The signal would be filtered and used to determine the speed of the lead screw motor. This allowed the groove spacing to open up just before loud passages and closed down during softer passages. And I thought, that was, that's really cool. I, I you know, have never studied the mechanics of how vinyl was cut, but you know, that idea of a pre-listen head, which could you know, act as an, an analog look-ahead filter, if you like, you know, allowing the, you know, the cutting lathe to then widen the groove for the louder passages and then tighten it up for the narrower stuff. That's, that's just a phenomenal. Well, it, I can I can definitely verify that there is a pre-listen head on mastering machines. Yeah, right. I would also admit that I'm not really f- all that familiar with how that relates to that motor, but generally speaking, mastering is almost a black art, uh, and a, a good mastering engineer is just an amazing thing. Yeah. Especially if they realize when they don't need to do anything or if they do need to do something, but it's just... There's nothing like a fantastic mastering engineer, whether you're going to vinyl or not. And uh, one of the, again, getting back to my students, one of the things I tell them is, is once you get to the point where you have a mix that you think is pretty good and you want to see if it really is, go to a real mastering engineer, not another student running Pro Tools, but go to a real mastering house. Go in there and spend an hour or two with a mastering engineer and you'll walk out of there finding out if it's real, if what you think you're doing is what's actually turning out and what you need to change to make it authentic and so on and so forth. And uh, that would still be my advice to anybody who's starting out as a recording engineer is to uh, hook up with a good mastering engineer so that you can get an objective, really intelligent point of view about your work output. That's a great piece of advice and and one I should employ. Uh, I don't know if I mentioned to you, but I have a a good mate who lives, again, about three hours from where I live, who I feel is a very talented singer-songwriter. And he and I have just finished recording and mixing his fifth album of original material. But it's been a case of me doing the mixing and the quote unquote mastering and you know it's just an indie release but it would be it would be great to be able to take those pre-mastered mixes of mine and sit down with an a mastering engineer and get his opinion on it i should find somebody locally that i could do that with oh yeah everybody who's done that you know comes away with a different understanding of yeah, right. where they sit in the process it's just interesting great. Interesting. I'm very lucky in that there's a lot of good mastering engineers near me here in the LA area. Oh, yeah. Very fortunate that way. And you play Uh, guitar yourself, don't you, Doc? I've been known to, absolutely. (laughs) As I sit here, I can look around and see 15 guitars or so laying around. Right. Okay. (laughs) And do you collaborate with other musicians or do you play everything yourself? Uh, Both. Right, I do both. Uh, yeah, nice. Lately, I've been lately I've been doing it, it all myself, but I don't actually prefer that. Sure. Lately, lately I've been recording this local band. Okay. Because they do a lot of co- good cover tunes, and I like I enjoy doing it because because they're doing cover tunes. I can go back and listen to the original mix from the original artist that did the song, and take some of those ideas and use them for the mixes I'm doing for this band. And it's oh nice. It's been very inter- it's, it's been interesting because some of the original mixes. Uh, are actually not very good, so <laughs> right, and that's very enlightening. Yeah, you know, I won't I, I won't mention which ones those are, but there are <laughs> uh, there there are uh, quite a few hit records that the mixes just aren't that good, and of course there are some that are. So I, I don't mean to say that they're all like that, but there's a few out there, which tells me that 
the engineering, as important as it is, is still secondary to the music. You know, if the music is really great, yes, people won't care if it's engineered good or not because they're too busy enjoying the music. Definitely, uh, and, definitely. And I, that's that's been true, I and mean, I could name a few songs. But do, I won't. do you know a, a song that immediately jumps to mind on that f- particular idea is uh, "Lightning Crashes" by Live. Uh, you know the the guitar hum in that you know electric guitar at the start of that song i remember the first time i heard it i went who the heck let this out of the studio with all that noise but it's such a great song that you end up just completely disregarding the noise and it just becomes part of the character of the whole song or maybe they felt it added some authenticity that they were trying to get across and that is a that is a legitimate point of view oh definitely definitely you know? So yeah, that's a that's a great topic for a, another podcast as well. Well, you know the human the human ear you, you can you can tune out something you don't want to hear, but a microphone can't do that. So yeah. sometimes you might you might be in a room when there's a lot of background noise and you don't even notice it, but if you're recording the proceedings and you listen to it later, all that noise is like what? Yeah. What, what, what am I hearing? Where did all that come from? <laughs> yes. Because the mic can't discriminate in the way that we can because there's no yeah. brain hooked up to a microphone. Which gets into choosing what mic for what purpose and blah, 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 yada, yada, yada. Definitely, definitely. Hey, do you know Larry Crane? Larry Crane. I know he, of Larry Crane. He, he's the guy who puts out tape op. Right. Um, I wasn't sure if, if he was in your circle of uh, you know accomplices. I think I met him at an AES show or two. Right. I think the last time I saw him, I was complaining because... Uh, you know, the magazine is supposed to be free and you just give them your name and the magazine shows up and I do that and it continues to not show up. <laughs> and so I was I was complaining about that and he said he'd take care of it and then the magazine showed up for a couple of months and then it stopped again. So, <laughs> right. Uh, <laughs> do you not get it digitally? Uh, I, no. Right. So I could sign up for that. I just haven't done it. But I do like the magazine. I think yeah. they really do fulfill a, a, a purpose. Oh, definitely. A good purpose. Uh, but so. something that I noticed uh, just in the last week was I got an email from Tape Op saying, hey, great news, we've started a podcast. And I thought, oh, you beauty. I, you know, that is. As much as I have, great. As much as I have my own, I love listening to other people's podcasts, you know, about audio engineering as well. So I went and downloaded the first episode, which is an interview with Brian Eno. And I thought, wow, what a way to start, you know. Oh, yeah. (laughs) It's all downhill from here, you know. (laughs) But the thing that I found kind of baffling was, I mean, he's hosting it on SoundCloud, which I I don't have a problem with, but it was uploaded in WAV format. It wasn't compressed to an MP3. And there was no mastering applied to it whatsoever. There were, you know, the peaks were at minus six and the body of the waveform was sort of at minus 12. And I was thinking, really, Larry, I'd have thought you'd have at least run some compression and peak limiting and, you know, brought it up to a a decent sort of level. Well, that's interesting. That is interesting. It is. So I'm not, I'm not bagging it. I, I'm just saying I was baffled by the whatever thought processes went on that led him to release it the way he did. And it was released in stereo, which I kind of thought was probably a little bit unnecessary if it's just a conversation of a few guys sitting around a, an omnidirectional mic, then you could release it as mono and half the bandwidth. But anyway, well, maybe maybe uh, subsequent ones uh, will be better. Maybe, maybe they were in a big hurry and the, the big hurry wanted to get it out, so just did it. And maybe the next one will be different. Who knows? Yeah. So I'm I'm gonna I'm I will definitely send him an email and say, hey, these are just a, a couple of things that I I thought about the first episode. But I loved you know the interview, and I'm certainly looking forward to hearing more of of what they put out on the Tape Up podcast. And and again, I'll put that link in the show notes for anyone that wants to check that out. All right, Doc, I think we've uh, we've milked this one for all it's worth. What do you reckon? <laughs> sure. I don't want to say everything I know in the first podcast. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Got to save something for the you next You know, that one. would take me another five minutes, so I, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, mate, it is great to have you on board, and uh, I'm looking forward to getting some feedback from the listeners. Please send us more questions, uh, either via email, uh, and you'll hear the email in the in the closer. We've set up a new email address. 
Uh, I might as well just tell you now, it's theboys at signlanguagepodcast.com. So you can send us questions there. You can check out the Facebook page, uh, which is Sign Language Podcast. There's obviously you know the ability to write on the wall there, so you can post questions there. Any questions you've got specifically aimed at Doc, by all means, knock yourself out. I'm sure he would love to hear from you. Doc, is there anywhere on social media that you want people to follow you or you happy just to interact through this? Not really. Not really. Okay. You just do it the way you just said. It's just fine. Okay. I'm not a big social media person. Sure. I do have a Facebook page, but um, I'm, I don't even look at it very often. So what can I say? <laughs> Fair enough. Excellent. All right, mate. Well, good to talk to you. And uh, I think going forward, this podcast is not going to be a weekly podcast. I know it was back in the dim, dark past, but it certainly hasn't been of late. I think Doc and I are probably thinking every two to three weeks, depending on how we're going with our own personal lives and finding the time to do it. Does that sound fair, Doc? Well, I remember you used the word fort- fortnight, and I That's went, right. what the heck? What the <laughs> heck is that? <laughs> yeah. You know, so I had to ask you, and yeah, that was pretty I, funny, but that yeah, sounds about I, right. Yeah, so every two to three weeks, as, as we as we see fit. Not, not a big term here in the colonies, right? No, apparently not. I didn't realize that. So, anyway, fun and games. All right, mate, well, we'll, uh, we'll talk to you in a few weeks. Okay, talk to you. Sign language. Another audio to you.com quality podcast. For questions, comments, and feedback, email the boys at signlanguagepodcast.com.